Nobody likes this. Everybody hates this. Why does it also suck to drive in? I'm here reporting to you from Asheville's newest, shiniest road, the freshly widened Lester Highway in all its glory. Does anybody know when they're going to start widening the road out in Lester? The road she's referring to is New Lester Highway. This road was originally two lanes of traffic total, one in either direction, but it was recently expanded to four lanes of through traffic at a cost of $34 million. God, I love being in car world. Do we want to spend tens of millions of dollars making a place like this more like this? A scary place that feels like no place. Do we really want more of this? Is this the best type of place we can make? Now, when it comes to construction costs for road projects, it can be a little bit difficult to conceive of whether $34 million is a lot of money or a little money. So here's some context to give you an idea of what that number really means. Asheville's entire city transit budget for 2023 was a total of $14 million, which means this roadway widening project was almost two and a half times more expensive than Asheville's yearly transit budget. Now, most of the routes on the Asheville bus system come at a frequency of once an hour. The most frequent ones come every 30 minutes, and some of them even come once every 90 minutes. I'm not kidding. So given that context, I'll let you decide whether or not you think this was a worthwhile $34 million investment into transportation in Western North Carolina. Here's some shots of the highway from before it was widened versus after it was widened to give you an idea of the changes that they made that were worth $34 million. Worth it. Worth it. Definitely worth it. Definitely absolutely worth it. This is better, not worse. There's definitely no way that this money could have been put to higher use. For this project, they used eminent domain to affect 159 parcels, and they destroyed nine houses and one business. Definitely worth it. What about other modes of transportation? Well, they couldn't afford a sidewalk, but they could afford five foot paved shoulders for accommodating bicycle traffic. What that is, is a safety feature for cars so that they are less likely to hurt themselves or someone else, rebranded as bicycle infrastructure. Now you might argue, this isn't anything like the Patton Avenue Strode that you showed in your previous video. Where are all the excess traffic lights and extra lanes and all of the businesses? Well, the thing is, when Patton was first constructed, it didn't look like it does today. It looked a lot like this. And they didn't remove any access when they widened it and there's nothing preventing additional access from being added in the future. This is how the Strode begins. This is a baby Strode. This is the beginning of a Patton Avenue. Now, if you don't know what a Strode is, go watch part one of this video. It explains the whole thing in great detail. So I've made my point. This is not my favorite project, but surely the North Carolina Department of Transportation has learned from their mistakes and is going to be making better designs for projects moving forward, right? 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 This is the corner of Mountain Road and 191, otherwise known as Brevard Road. So the plan, according to the North Carolina Department of Transportation in 2017, is to widen a four and a half... Maybe I shouldn't have put the camera directly behind a turning lane where cars just sit in front of the camera. So the plan, according to the North Carolina Department of Transportation in 2017, is to widen a four and a half mile stretch of 191 Brevard Road from Mountain Road right here all the way to 280, um, otherwise known sometimes as Airport Road. This roadway widening project would cost $48 million. And the DOT justifies this using claims about level of service, which is a metric that was designed for measuring congestion on freeways, but is routinely used across the United States to measure the level of congestion on local streets. So the DOT commissions a traffic study, which measures the vehicle counts at multiple points along the road all throughout the day. And then what they do is they determine the level of service by basically looking at the peak times when the roadway is the most congested. And if there's congestion or evidence of congestion along a route, that is justification enough for the DOT that the project should happen, no matter the cost. The Balfour Parkway was a proposed project to laterally connect 191 to US 25, I 26, and 64. And it was gonna be built nearby in this area, connect around here. The thing is, the original traffic study for this road widening project was performed under the assumption that that was going to be built and lead to increased traffic counts. Here's what the original traffic study says about the Balfour Parkway. 
This project is included in the 2026-2030 Horizon Year Plan of the MTP and therefore is included in the 2030 and 2040 models. Travel patterns are altered because of nearby future projects, improvements to I-26, and the completion of the Balfour Parkway. Then, due to outcry and protest from the community, the Balfour Parkway project was canceled and removed from the STIP. According to the publication Blue Ridge Now, the Mills River Town Council voted in June to endorse a five-lane widening after more than a year of back and forth about NCDOT's plans. They formally adopted a resolution requesting the design all the way from Mountain Road to 280. But that's not what the people here want. This project has actually already hurt the community by causing some businesses to close their doors in Mills River. Sergio Castro, the owner of Connoisseur Latin Fusion, has called Asheville home for the last 35 years. You know, it's a little sad because we have five years and it was really good. Business was great. Uh, the community is awesome. He says the reason they're having to close down is due to the roadway outside of their restaurant, NC Highway 191 expanding. All the parking going to be gone, so they have to redo the whole building set up and there's nothing they can do about it. You know, the road is going to come right to the parking lot. The 191 Alliance was formed to oppose this project on the grounds that the cancellation of the Balfour Parkway project invalidated the original traffic study used to justify the 191 widening. When you Google this project, you'll find on the Hendersonville government website a petition that is a scan of a physical piece of paper signed by 441 residents of this area. And believe me, I counted. It's 441. This is just amazing to me. A scan of a physical piece of paper with the signatures of over 400 people on it. I mean, that seems really hard to do. People clearly don't want this project to move forward. And it's not hard to see why. The secretary of a local homeowners association of a subdivision connected to 191 pointed out that the 2008 traffic forecast for this road was predicted to be 14,400 vehicles. But in reality, the amount of vehicles per day on this road is actually 12,600. And the roadway's current capacity is listed at 16,700 vehicles per day. Residents signed an online petition saying, I live on 191 and it seems that an increase in speed limit will amplify an already dangerous egress onto 191. People speed frequently. Thank you. Another person said, a four lane highway ruins the look, character, and the beauty of a rural community. We have enough highways. Mills River can grow quite easily without a superhighway. Someone else said, as a person who frequently travels 191, I see that there are only a couple of times a day when traffic is heavy. Being a sensible person, I avoid that area during those times. DOT is usually very uninformed as to the needs of the individual counties and want to impose their will as they move from proposed project to proposed project. And that's exactly right. There really isn't a major traffic problem on this road. And any traffic problems that do exist certainly shouldn't be solved with spending $48 million on a massive capacity expansion throughout the entire stretch. Especially when it comes to not only such a dramatic financial cost, but also at such a great cost to the place that's being affected. But the project's manager, Scott Miller III, said that even though the numbers were smaller than projections, they still constitute the need for the widening, and the need for the project has been on the books longer than the Balfour Parkway. There's also a difference between what the public generally feels can be accommodated on the roadway and what the properly designed road can accommodate according to projections for the design year of 2040. The people who oppose this project are experiencing the disconnect between the reality of their experience as residents of this place and what the DOT is willing to claim in order to have their way and get their project done. All you have to do is look at the broader picture of the DOT's plans outside of this project to see that this is not the only planned widening of this road, and this is not the only widening of this road that has happened. This section of Brevard Road is between I-240 and I-40, and it was widened at some point between 1998 and 2002, based on satellite photos that I've looked at. The next section of this road immediately south between I-40 and I-26 was widened in 2010. They widened the section between I-26 and Sardis Road when they built the mall in 1989. A large section of 191 was widened from Sardis Road to the Blue Ridge Parkway in 2005 as part of Project STIP U3403 Section C. So those are the sections that have already been widened, but future widenings are going to happen too. As part of the same STIP Project 3403, Section B will widen 191 from the Blue Ridge Parkway all the way to Ledbetter Road. Section A for that project is unfunded but planned and will widen it from Ledbetter Road all the way to NC280. And would you look at that, we've reached the northern terminus of the project that we were talking about in the first place, which will widen it from 280 down to Mountain Road. And there's another plan to widen it from Mountain Road 
all the way to 25. So zooming out, you can clearly see that this Mills River 191 widening project is not about fixing a problem or improving the quality of place or improving the quality of life for the people who live there. Instead, it's about completing a decades old project to turn all of 191 into a high capacity road to support all of the future suburban growth that the NCDOT wants to happen. And that growth is all assumed to be car dependent suburban growth. It doesn't matter that they're already spending over half a billion dollars doubling the capacity of I-26, which is a true grade separated arterial corridor immediately adjacent. What the NCDOT wants is a suburban four lane road along the entire length of 191. This is not even close to the only road that the NCDOT wants to be a high capacity, four lane, dangerous, expensive road. The main north-south corridors through suburban South Asheville are 191, which is 50% completed in terms of its conversion from a two-lane road into a five-lane high-capacity road. Interstate 26, which is an interstate and is having its capacity doubled at the moment. Hendersonville Road, otherwise known as US 25, which has been a five-lane high-capacity road for a while. And then uh, US 25A, otherwise known as Sweeten Creek Road. I'm standing here right now at the point where it tapers down from a five-lane road into a two-lane road. In fact, let me just show you. This section of Sweeten Creek Road was widened from here to I-40 when they added an I-40 interchange for this road in the early 2000s. The southern half of Sweeten Creek Road is still not a divided road. So you can imagine what the DOT wants to do. Even despite capacity increases underway on literally every other alternative parallel route, they still want this to be a high-speed road. Oh yeah, and they want to spend $200 million doing it. I found out about all of the Greater Asheville widening projects on roads like 191 and Sweeten Creek Road because they're integral pieces of the city that I live in and I was just curious about their future. But the reality is that the projects that I've talked about in this video are just singular examples of a broader pattern of projects in the North Carolina Department of Transportation and in departments of transportation across the country. And I wanted to figure out how big this problem really is and how bad the future really looks for new strodes. So guess what I did? Well, first to understand it, you have to understand the STIP. So every state in the United States is required under federal law to pass a statewide transportation improvement program at least every four years. The STIP basically describes all of the projects that the DOT is gonna be taking on over the course of the next 10 years. In June 2023, North Carolina released its STIP for the next 10 years, covering 2024 through 2033. So I took the time to comb through so much data to figure out which of these STIP projects are projects that will create new strodes. So what are the criteria for what constitutes a new strode? My criteria was basically any time that a road three lanes or less is getting turned into a road four lanes or more with special considerations for things like traffic signals, the existence of business along the corridor, things like that. It's sort of a you know it when you see it situation, but I genuinely did look through these projects and make judgment calls about which ones I thought were strodes and which ones I thought were not. And uh, holy hell. It's bad. Adding up the total for the funding listed for all of the new Strode projects over the next 10 years, the figure is over $10 billion. Since filming this, I went back through the spreadsheet and looked at a couple of things that appeared to be duplicates to me at first, but uh, actually are separate portions of the same project and added all of those back in. And the figure increased to $11.4 billion. That's $1 billion a year being spent to construct new Strodes in North Carolina. Now, I'll admit that this number isn't perfect. It's actually probably underestimating it pretty drastically because a lot of the projects listed in the STIP actually don't have any funding uh, listed alongside them at all. And on top of that, what this spreadsheet shows is the planned cost for these projects. But they frequently overrun their budgets and they will be more expensive when built in real life than planned in the STIP. So in reality, the 10 billion number, as astoundingly and shockingly high as it is, is still too low to estimate the amount of resources that we are pouring into strode projects. Speaking of the finances of the STIP, I wanna talk about how the financial mechanisms of the DOT work a little bit. It's really easy to see where the priorities are when you look at the diagram in the STIP of how the funding mechanism works. So the, motor, so the motor fuel tax goes into the highway trust fund and the highway fund. The highway use tax goes into the highway trust fund and the highway fund. 
and uh, DMV fees and the general fund, those go into the highway trust fund uh, and the highway fund. Um, and all the federal funding, that also goes into the highway trust fund. This is also demonstrated in the stats that they provide about which kinds of projects they're including in the STIP and what proportion. 74% of the projects in the STIP are highway projects. Most of the projects in the STIP are top-down mega projects that will build things to a final finished state. What we're getting is $100 million projects that can't really take into consideration the needs of the granular community. All those projects can do is look at the broader scope and then bulldoze a highway through it. It's never ending. And I want to emphasize, these are projects that will take places that are currently fine and they are going to increase the capacity for cars to create a place more like this. So I've made this spreadsheet full of the filtered data of all of North Carolina's road projects over the next 10 years available. You can find it in the description below. Um, if you live in North Carolina, I encourage you to take a look at your county and see what projects are gonna go in. And if you live in the United States, I strongly encourage you to find your state's STIP and figure out which projects are going to be affecting. So why have I just explained all of this to you? It's not because I think you particularly care about this random road in North Carolina, and it's not because I think talking about finances is a great time. It's because part one of this video describes the problem in great length, in detail. And what I need to do now is provide a solution. And I intend for this video to be the beginning of me explaining what that solution could be. I don't only want to talk about the way that our places are flawed. I also want to talk about the ways that we can make them better. I want to talk about suburban retrofit, and I want to talk about how to make these roads safe. And I want to talk about successes in land use policy that can be emulated elsewhere in order to make places better. I want to talk about how we can maximize the things that we've already built and overbuilt to make them better, especially to serve latent demand for multimodal transit. But first, before I make those videos, I have another message I want to make clear. If we want to be capable of making good places, we have to stop actively making abysmal places. We have a complex system of local, state, and federal law and complex funding mechanisms that support this pattern of growth. But the thing is, the current inertia and trajectory of our system is pointed at aggressive horizontal car-dependent expansion. If we don't change the root causes of that problem, that is what is going to result. And don't get me wrong, the solution here is bottom-up change and the ability to change and affect our neighborhoods on a granular level. I believe that hyper-local problems have to be solved on a hyper-local level. But I think that's building. I think that's happening, and I think we know how to do that. But this is my concern. Why pour a billion dollars into fixing a place that currently sucks when we're spending $10 billion creating new places that suck in the exact same way? Every dollar spent on a new Strode is a resource that could have been put into making a good place. The financial issue is extremely concerning, but I think even more concerning to me is the issue of the actual people who are going to live in these places. The built environment currently encourages car-dependent living in a car-dependent place. And what that means is there's a ton of people who, if they had a better option, they would take it, but it's not available to them. And that's where the latent demand is. And the more aggressive horizontal suburban expansion that we do, the larger that latent demand will become. As we continue to build more and more disproportionate amounts of single family housing, every person who lives in those single family houses that would choose another option if it were available to them is a resident lost from a community that would benefit from their presence. Financially, socially, physically, those residents won't be there. They'll be in single family houses. So for high quality, mixed use, walkable, transit available places to ever become the norm for the new stuff that we build, we have to do two things. The first is change our local and state level laws about land use and transportation. And the second is to redirect our funding mechanisms on the state and federal level so that that money goes into creating those kinds of uses that we want rather than encouraging further suburban development. We definitely have our work cut out for us in terms of repairing our downtowns, removing scars from our urban fabric, like urban freeways that separate communities, uh, retrofitting our first ring suburbs. I think all of that's starting right now. And I want to talk about all that. But you can't just treat the symptoms of the disease. We have to address the underlying sickness. It's like we've been living with black mold in the vents.
and everybody's condition just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and we keep treating their symptoms without ever actually dealing with the black mold. We gotta get the black mold removed if we're ever gonna actually fix this problem for real. We've been shooting ourselves in the foot with a machine gun for 70 years. And yeah, it's a good idea to bandage up your foot after it's been shot up that much. But first you have to stop pulling the trigger and creating new holes in your foot. Otherwise, what does it matter what healing you try to do? If you're still riddling your foot with bullet holes. So the beginning of the solution is no new strokes. No more money spent making deadly places. That money has to be spent making economically productive places that provide a good quality of life for the people who live there. It's my opinion that these reforms will happen inevitably, either by choice or by necessity. I think in a few decades, we'll look back on the cities that started fixing their urban design first as the ones that are doing the best compared to all the cities that decide to spend the next 10, 15, 20 years building new suburbs. So let's do this right now. Let's cancel these widening projects. Let's reinvest that money. Let's create a funding mechanism for these transportation dollars to go elsewhere. And let's start fixing land use policy on a local level to support the kind of growth that doesn't require new roads like this. How do we do that? I don't know yet, but I wanna to talk to the experts. I wanna know how we can point our growth machine at good urbanism and not new suburbs. But I personally think it's inevitable. I think it'll happen by choice or by necessity. Let's figure out how to make it happen by choice before we got to do it out of necessity. That's how this video was originally supposed to end, but then at the 11th hour of the edit, something kind of amazing happened. In fact, we need an entire overhaul of how we do transportation funding. This is Congressman Jake Auchincloss. He's a 35-year-old Democrat in the House of Representatives serving the 4th Congressional District of Massachusetts. On Wednesday, January 17th, 2024, during a Transportation Infrastructure Committee hearing, he argued for an overhaul of federal transportation financing. We've got to free our infrastructure from the grip of big oil and car-centric planning by handing highway funding and administration entirely over to the states. The Highway Trust Fund is running such a massive de deficit that the gas tax couldn't meet its needs even if it were five times higher. And what is doled out is allocated without reference to the metrics that matter most, like how well projects connect people to jobs, services, and one another. The driving metric is simply more vehicle miles. The federal transportation system incentivizes states to build road after road without regard to future costs of maintenance, operation, and environmental impact. Congress should leave highway taxation and spending entirely to the states and commensurately remove federal, federal red tape and regulations on highways so that states and cities can use their dollars to address local mobility with organic solutions. He's speaking to the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, which directly oversees and regulates the United States Department of Transportation on a federal level. This is gonna have three beneficial impacts. First, it will give states and cities more latitude that will encourage local innovation. Second, it will compel an honest accounting of the cost of car-centric infrastructure. I would hazard that we can spend as much money as we want. We can match the full $1.4 trillion that accidents cost us in funding the departments of transportation. But if we continue to build car-centric infrastructure, we're gonna to continue to get car accidents. More tragically to the point, we're gonna to continue to kill pedestrians, which the United States is doing at an alarming and increasing rate. A transparent account of the cost of maintenance of highways will make it more likely that states implement strategies like congestion pricing and improved alternative mobility options. This transition will be disruptive to politicians and bureaucrats, but the net effect will be a low, lower carbon footprint, better mobility, and more walkable downtowns. Chairman, I'd like to introduce to the record the op-ed I wrote to this effect for strong towns without objection so ordered you, you mentioned strong towns yeah. the strodes the the roads you're that's, a strong towns i am reader. familiar with strong towns yes that's terrific um if you've made it to this point in the video you're either somebody who already knows what strong towns is or you're somebody who needs to know what strong towns is and should google it right now but if you don't know it's a nonprofit organization founded by charles marone he's the guy who coined the term strode they're doing a lot of the thought leadership around these issues and this guy is the secretary of the washington state Department of Transportation, who has been called in as an expert witness to this hearing. We uh, have recommended a safety program, a competitive grant program, specifically for state highways that go through population centers, because we're trying to move people through those spaces while providing access to those spaces at the same time. And the need for pedestrian and, and bicycle and automobile safety investment is huge because the fatality rates on those highways are twice the state average. Yes. The serious injury rates on those highways are three times the state's average. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's going to persist for so long as the federal government continues to incentivize car-centric um, highway 
infrastructure as opposed to empowering states to connect people to jobs and services through the multitude of modalities, walking, cycling, uh, micromobility. Um, we need to let the states run their transportation systems and not be subsidizing uh, automobiles. So on the one hand, the solution to the problem that I've been describing in these videos, it requires individual people coming together as a community and putting in the effort to try to change their environment to become better. Absolutely. It also requires changes to policy on a granular level by policymakers in boring, dry, sterile environments. And I see that starting to happen in examples like this, where the Strong Town's message is creeping through and starting to actually matter to politicians. So I think it's a matter of continuing to raise awareness, raise understanding, and as constituents, raise our concerns about our deadly streets. Um, and when that is combined with the economic incentive to end suburban expansion and to invest that money elsewhere, which will have a better return on investment, I think we could see some real regulatory change in this space. So no new strodes. Thanks so much for watching my video. Uh, I've been working on this really, really hard for a while. So your willingness to watch it means everything to me. Um, and for the first time in my life, I'm going to unironically ask for the rate, comment, and subscribe. So if you want to subscribe or hit the notification bell or share with some friends, that would be lovely. I'm already working on the next thing to come out. Uh, I hope to increase the frequency with which I can make these videos because right now the first two have taken me three months total to make uh, each. And that's not enough videos. I want to release more than four videos this year. So anyway, I hope to make videos a bit more frequently. They may be a bit shorter. Also, if you live in Asheville and you're interested in this, Check out Strong Towns Asheville. It's a page founded by several community members who are looking to make this city better. Um, I'm one of the founding members of it. You can find a little bit of video content that I'm posting there as well. So highly recommend Strong Towns Asheville. Check it out. And finally, I'm always open to your feedback in the comments. So if there's something in this video that you feel like I left out or something that you wanted more expansion upon or something that you just disagree with or something that you think was insightful and good, um, feel free to leave a comment and engage the algorithm. Let it know to show the video to other people. Um, and I may even respond because I respond to a good portion of the comments. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.